official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official Alright, uh, quickly for everyone in, in, in the class The... The things on, uh, that's on the docket for everyone here, uh, homework two. Oops. Homework two is going to be due uh, this coming up Sunday on the 22nd, and then project one will be due a week after on the following Sunday on on the 29th, and then as I post on Piazza, we'll have a recitation for project one tomorrow night at 6 p.m. That'll be over Zoom, but we're going to record it and post it on on Piazza afterwards. And as I said on Piazza, I encourage you to at least start looking at project one that way when you show up to the recitation you can ask questions like that are more meaningful because you've looked at the code and you're asking things that you don't understand rather than like you know what, what's a header file right stupid things like that okay any questions about homework two or project one uh, i know that someone's ranking very high in the leaderboard congrats to that person and again you get extra credit if you rank higher than everyone else and there's i think up to the top 10 we'll give extra credit okay uh, additional things that are optional that you can attend if you can't get enough of, can't get enough of databases. So starting next Monday on the 23rd, uh, we have somebody from InfluxDB, one of the, the, the uh, project committers for uh, Apache Data Fusion, is going to give an overview of, of, of that sort of framework, that, that library that you can use to build systems. Um, and then the following week, we'll actually have the inventor of Data Fusion give a talk, but he's now at Apple uh, on a accelerator that they built for Spark called Data Fusion Comet that uses, obviously, Data Fusion. It replaces the, the Java runtime, the, basically the execution engine in Java, or sorry, execution engine in Spark that's written in Java with, a, with Data Fusion, which is written in, in Rust. And it's optimized, uh, better optimized than the Java stuff. And then, uh, again, so this is all in two weeks. And then on Tuesday, October 1st, the database group here will have be having a, a, a weekly meeting on Tuesday at 12 p.m. in gate 6501. And we're having somebody from Oracle, uh, I think they're calling in over Zoom to give a talk uh, about, about some of the stuff they've been working on. Okay? So there's big news this week in databases. I don't know if anybody caught it. I think I guess what it is. The founder uh, of Oracle, uh, Larry Elson, is now the, the second richest person in the world. Now, I actually checked before class. He went back down. He's now third, right? But <laughs> But there was a brief moment where he, he was second because the Oracle stock surge, and, he, and he, he outranked Jeff Bezos. Again, Jeff Bezos really should be first, but he got divorced, and he gave half his money back you know, to McKenzie, right? But whatever. Larry also, he's been divorced four times. But actually, his second wife sold her, because it was the first year or second year he started Oracle back in the 70s. She sold her, uh, her stock for Oracle back to Larry Elson for $500. Right? So... So I'm going to mess on that one. Anyway, uh, again, he's the, he's the third richest person in the world, all paid for by databases. He owns a Hawaiian island, and like a, a good one, right? A big one, <laughs> Lanai. Uh, it's all paid for by databases. And that's why you guys are here, OK? Again, so these are all optional uh, if you want to go beyond the course. OK. So to recap what we've talked about so far in, 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 the, in the weeks, in, this, in the early beginning of the semester, right? Again, we started at the bottom. We talked about the disk management. Then we went above that last class. We talked about the buffer pool manager, how, how we're going to keep track of the pages we're bringing from disk into memory. And then now it's time to start doing something with those pages. Right? We know how they're going to be organized. We know, how, we know how to put data in them. Now it's actually time to, to build the execution engine to interpret what those, those pages are, rep, are storing and run queries and store data and do, do all the things you expect a database system to do for us. So for the, the next couple of weeks, we're going to focus on what, what we'll call access methods. Uh, and these are going to be the internal components of the system that's going to allow us to, as it sounds, access data or access the, the, the pages we want that we're storing and derive meaning from them. And we're going to first, first talk about the data structures we're, we're going to use that can be represented by the disk pages that we're bringing back, uh, bringing, you know, from disk into memory. And so today's class, we're going to be talking about hash tables, which will be unordered data structures. And these are going to be used th all throughout the system for various things. And then on Monday's class next week, we'll talk about trees, uh, in particular the B plus tree, right? These are going to be data structures that, are, that can preserve the ordering of, of values or keys. 
I'm going to want that for obvious reasons because we want to know where things are sorted, how to do ranking and other stuff. Okay. So again, so we're, we're in the middle part of the system now, and now we're going to start building more complex things on the basic primitives that we've, we've constructed so far in the previous lectures. So we'll first talk about the background of what a hash table is and why it matters. Uh, then we'll briefly talk about hash functions, what they are. We're not a, uh, it's obviously not a crypto class. It's not a low level algorithms class. So we don't really care what hash function we want to use. Uh, we'll just pick whatever we consider the best one. And I'll show you how to figure that out. And then we'll talk about two types of hash tables, static hashing schemes, where you assume the, or the, the, the data structure has a fixed number of elements that are key, key value pairs that it can store. And then we'll talk about a dynamic hashing scheme that allows a, a hash table that can grow. Uh, most of the time, you're going to grow up, not down, like you, instead of shrinking. But we'll talk about how to do shrinking in one of them as well. And the idea is that you can incrementally grow your, your, your system over time, or so your, your data structure over time, to accommodate more data. And then we have, at the end of uh, today's class, the last 10 minutes, we'll have a speaker from Relational AI, who unfortunately, the, the co-founder has to come this week to our, to our visit day uh, for Monday and Tuesday, but he, uh, he couldn't make it because of other issues. So. But they're, they're going to give a talk today about what they're doing. And I will say, as a spoiler, Relational AI is going to be a weird system. Uh, it's, it's pretty far out there, much different than what you normally think of in a database system. And I think they're really do, doing some cool things. Um, who here has ever heard of data log? Nobody. Okay, so data log will be a alternative to SQL to represent uh, to, to to run write queries over data, and I think they translate SQL to data log, and then data log is, allows you to do certain things that you can't really do e easily in SQL. Um, and it's oftentimes used in like hardcore modeling, but again, these guys uh, they're really smart and they talk about some of the cool stuff that they're doing. Okay, so this is sort of obvious. Database systems we need data structures, right? We need them for basically every part of, of the system. So obviously internal metadata, we'll see this when we keep track of like the page, the page directory, right? That's basically some kind of data structure that allows us to say for a given page ID, where to go find it. We saw how in index organized tables, we could actually have the data structure itself be the way we represent data, like having the leaf nodes in our tree structure be the place where we're gonna store tuple values or tuples. We're gonna need these for temporary data structures and this is going to seem like kind of crazy, but like it, it, oftentimes when you run a query, you're actually going to build a big hash table, do something real quickly on it, and then immediately throw it away. So we need to have data structures that we can tear up and throw down very, very quickly. And we see, we'll see some optimizations of how to handle those. And then the last one is probably what, what you're most familiar with, using them for table indexes. Like for given some key, either the primary key or a secondary key, one key or multiple keys together, we want to be able to do a mapping from that to, to find a tuple. In some of the indexes, it'll be the, the record ID that we talked about before will be the value of the, of the index. Like I do a key lookup, I get to the leaf node, now I have the, the, the record ID that I can then jump to the page that has the data I want. In some SQLs, like MySQL, for example, the value actually is going to be, uh, for secondary indexes, the primary key. So you do a secondary key lookup in the index, get to the bottom, now you get the primary key, do another lookup in the primary key index. Right? From a data structure perspective, it doesn't really matter uh, what, what it's actually storing. But again, indexes are going to be very important for us, and we'll start covering them more in the next class. So if we're now going to build our system from scratch and decide what we want our data structures to do, we want to think about what are the design goals we need to have in our, in our system. Right? So how are we going to lay out the data structure in memory or in these disk pages so that we can do efficient access on them? Right? We obviously want to avoid NP-complete problems or N uh, solutions. Uh, but in some cases, it, it, you know, the, com the complexity might actually be pretty bad. And again, as I said before, we may choose certain data structures that in memory might be the most, most, may not be the most efficient way to do it, but because we could be reading something from disk and we want to maximize the sequential access, that is actually the right data structure to do. The spoiler is going to be the B plus trees actually works for both in memory and, and disk. That's why it's the best. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll cover that next class. Then the next thing we need to worry about is how are we going to allow multiple threads or workers or processes in our database system access this data structure at the same time without causing problems for ourselves? And then we will cover this next class more, but there'll be basically two types of problems. There's physical layout problems or physical integrity problems where two threads are trying to write to the same thing at the same time and they clobber each other or there's like a dangling pointer and then you seg fault and crash because you follow a pointer to nowhere. But there'll be later in the semester we'll talk about logical problems where 
two threads try to insert the same key at the same time, what should happen? Should I have duplicate keys? Should one of them fail? And how, how do I handle that? Or say I insert something, somebody else comes and deletes my key, I come back and try to read my key again, should I see it? Right, that's a logical issue we'll cover, we'll cover later on. Right? And then uh, in two weeks, we'll, talk about, for, we'll start off talking about how to do single-threaded data structures. I'll sprinkle a little bit about latching as we go along, but there'll be a whole lecture just on how to make these things thread safe uh, in, in two weeks. All right, so hash table is a, uh, should, not be, uh, should not be a foreign concept to anybody here, uh, since it's upper level course. So you probably encounter these in, in, in other CS classes. But the, the high level idea is that it's going to implement what we call an associative, unordered associative array that's going to map keys to values. As I said, we can use this hash table in different parts of the system, so the keys and values could vary depending on the context of how it's being used. Right? It could be something for internal metadata, it could be the actual table indexes, and therefore the keys are related to tuples in the, in the tables. For our purposes here today, it doesn't matter, but I'll talk a little bit about how we handle uh, different corner cases with them. So it's going to do a mapping of key to values, and it's going to rely on this hash function to compute some offset or some location in the hash table for a given key. And that location is going to be either the exact location of, of that has the key that we want, or at least get us in hopefully close to it, where we can then search around and figure out where, where's, our, where's, where's the key that we, that we actually want. And so because it's unordered, and because this hash function uh, is, is basically taking any arbitrary byte, byte array, running through this hash function, and then you come out with this random number, you're basically making this be completely random I.O. Right? At, least, at least in the first step of jumping into the hash table with the hash function. Right? So instead of like in a order preserving data structure like a tree, right, where things are sorted based on you know, the key values or the keys, right, where I can sort of loop through, scan through the data structure and find things in the order I expect them, this hash table is really making things completely random. And this is going to be useful for us because it'll handle skew, hopefully, at least your hash function could hopefully handle skew, where now I can have sort of the data laid out evenly distributed throughout the, the data structure. And there's a lot of benefits of having, uh, having, that, having that randomness. So the space complexity of our hash tables are going to be ON, where N is that's the number of keys that we need to store. And then the uh, time complexity is going to be, on average, O1. Meaning, like in most cases, I, I do my I do my lookup into my hash table and I get I find exactly the thing I'm looking for, right? In the worst case scenario, though, it's going to be O n, meaning I have to look at every single key to find the thing I'm looking for or discover that the thing I want is is not there. So again, if you take an algorithms course, all the theory guys are salivating over O one, right? They think, oh yeah, that's great. Let me go do that, right? But in reality. You know, there's a constant factor involved in this, and we actually are going to care about them. So what I mean by that is, like, if our hash function is super, super slow, like it takes 100 milliseconds to compute the hash, then we jump into the hash table. Yeah, it's 01, but like 100 milliseconds is a long time, right? That, that's a couple of disk IOs. So even though the complexity, uh, the time complexity is is in our favor, I mean, we'll see B plus trees where they're, they're log n, but like we st we're going to still make sure that we implement everything as efficient as possible. Right? Because constants equal money. Right? And if, you're, if you're running a large system you're, you know, on expensive hardware, you don't want things to be slow. All right, so this is like a really basic static hash table. And this will sort of motivate why we're going to do the things uh, and do more complex schemes that we'll talk about in the rest of the lecture. So let's say that we just have a giant array um, where we know ahead of time the number of keys that we have. Let's say we have n keys. And we just have this giant array with... Uh, which is for you know, every possible key uh, we could have, we just have a pointer to some location uh, you know, on a page or in memory that has the, the, the data we want. And we don't worry too much just yet what, what actually we're pointing to, but you can assume this is, this is the key and followed by some value. Right? That, that's, again, that's the associated array in, of a hash table, keep mapping keys to values. Does this work? Technically, yes, right? This is a good idea, though. You're shaking your head no. Why? You said, uh, if, I think you were saying, if you have a sparse number of keys, like, you, like the, 
You could have one to a billion, but if you only have two keys, you still have to store a billion entries because you don't know what keys can be showing up. Yep, that's one problem. Yes? So he said that if uh, the hash of a key could, he said, clash, yeah, yeah, have a collision, it, it, collide it, it, with another one, right? But assume again, I assume I have, I know exactly I have n values, right? And I, I could have one slot for every single possible value, right? So you wouldn't have a collision. Yes? Uh, if you're, you're trying to resize a whole array, how do you distribute everything? She says if you have to resize the whole array, whole array you, you have to redistribute everything. No, why, right? Because I could just, if I have now n, n you know, 2n, I could just, have two n down here, and then I don't have to move anybody up above. That's not a problem. Think of this like a the identity function, like for given, say again, they're just integers. The integer that I, of my key just tells me what offset to go to, and then I have a pointer to go find the thing I want. Yes. It's not friendly to cache. It's not friendly to cache. Why? He says if the um, it's not it's not friendly to ca cache the CPU cache I'm assuming or it actually doesn't matter that the, the you're saying that the, the when you do the key lookup then you have to follow that pointer now you're jumping to some other location that may not be local to where you did the first lookup yeah. yeah that is a problem but we're gonna have that problem for other hash tables as well it's unavoidable all right so there's basically three assumptions that are that are not always realistic that a why this sort of simple static hash table aren't gonna work. First of all, that should be obvious is that I'm assuming I know the number of keys ahead of time, right? And then, as she said, well, what if you resize? Well, you could, you know, just double things uh, or add, add more spaces as you need. But it's very rare that you know exactly the number of keys and the domain of those keys ahead of time, right? And so, as he pointed out, it could be I have two keys out of a billion possible values, but I have to allocate a billion possible slots now, and I'm, it's a, I'm wasting space. Sort of related, he was saying that you could have keys collided, and I said, in the case, uh, if I assume that, well, he said you could have c uh, collisions on keys, and I said, well, if you assume they're unique, it's not a problem, but, if, but it's not always going to be unique, right? Just think of, like, doing lookups on, uh, you know, people taking this course. If I just try to find all the people in 445, 645, there's a bunch of you students here, you, you could potentially have collide on, on those same keys. And then the other one is this, this is more theoretical, but... Uh, I'm assuming that I have this magic identity function that can map me exactly to the exact location for a given key, just the, the, the a unique location in my, in my, my slot array, point array. Uh, and no matter what the value is, I can always guarantee that. And so if they're integers, yeah, you just take the identity. That's easy. But how do I handle strings? How do I handle variable length strings? Right? So this would be called, it was called a perfect hash function. I know Jignesh is doing some research in this area. But well, you basically have to mean some extra metadata. Extra metadata. It's, it's never truly perfect. But a perfect hash function would be for any unique key, you get a unique hash value, right? It shows up in the theory. In practice, you, you, it, it's not easy to do, it, and no system does it, right? So that means that we could have two keys that, if you just look at the bits of those keys, they're going to be different. But I run through my hash function, they're going to come back to the same hash value, and I have a collision. I have to handle that. Yes. He says, why assumption to a bad assumption? So what if I, so if I have, um, say you have, uh, say you have a, a database that has uh, a list of users, people, and then you have phone numbers, right? And so that phone number table has a foreign key reference to your user ID. But now you can have multiple phone numbers. So now if I try to say, for, for a given user ID, give me their phone number. If you have multiple phone numbers, then, then I can't have, in this, this example here, I would have two, you know, two things to point to for number two, but I can't do that in this, in this example. So a hash table at its core is comprised of two pieces that are going to handle all these, these issues that we just talked about. The first, as I said, is this hash function that's going to be, a, uh, be able to, to map some large key space, like any arbit you know, arbitrary string or, or float, timestamp, whatever you want, and it's going to map it to a, a smaller domain. And it's typically going to produce a fixed length value, like a 32-bit integer or a 64-bit integer. So when we decide our, how to, what hash function we want to use, we'll just see next, next slide, right, there's going to be this trade-off between we want it to be really fast, as I said. We don't want something to take hundreds of milliseconds to compute a hash. But then again, we don't want something to have a high collision rate. 
meaning for two distinct keys, I get back the same hash value. All right? What's the fastest possible hash function you can have? What's that? Identity. It's identity, even faster than that. Zero? Zero, yeah, or one, right? No matter what key I give you, I give you back one. The collision rate is terrible, right? But it's going to be fast because that's going to be hanging out in, in CP registers, right? So we want something that, there's obviously the two extremes. We want, we want something in the middle. And then the, the, the second design decision is going to be what we'll call the hashing scheme. And this is going to be the protocol that we're going to use to handle conflicts or key collisions, right? You have two distinct keys hashing to the same location in your hash table. What do we do? And again, there'll be this trade-off between uh, we just have this really large hash table with a, with a bunch of slots uh, where we could put keys in. And then the, if it's really big, it's very unlikely that we would have collision. But then now that means we need to store a lot of memory uh, or store a lot of disk, have, use a lot of disk space to store this giant hash table thing. And the other end extreme would be we only have a hash table with one slot and everything collides into that and we have to deal with that. You know, it's, it's less storage, but the compute's going to be much higher. So this is like classic computer science, the storage versus compute trade-off here. And, we, and depending on our environment, depending on our hardware, we want to maybe choose one scheme versus another. Okay? So we're going to go through both of these. Uh, in, in the, in, for hashing scheme, we'll discuss this again in the context of static hash tables. We have fixed size. Uh, and then we'll see dynamic hashing, hash, hash tables where you, you can scale up and down. All right, so as I said, a hash function at its core is just going to be some, for some input key, we return back some uh, integer representation of that key. Right? It's, it's usually 32 or 64 bits, right? So this is the nice advantage that's taking an arbitrary byte array, that's the key, and coming back with a fixed length value. And as I said, we want something that's going to be fast. We want something to have a low collision rate. We don't care about any cryptographic properties of the hash function we're using. So if you're familiar with like SHA-256 or SHA-1, uh, these things are very expensive. We don't want to use them because we don't, we're not leaking any information. Right? This is a hash function we're using internally for our database system. It's not, you know, someone's already given the database system that we're building their data. They're going to trust us to operate on it. So a hash function is, you know, doesn't need to be, it's not exposing anything to the outside world. Like you don't build a hash table and show it to everyone, right? So we don't need any of these things. We just want something that can, has the, the nice collision rate versus uh, speed. So good news is that we don't need to design a hash, hash function for ourselves. There's a lot of available out there written by really smart people that we can just exploit and, and use on our database system. And this is what nearly all database systems, Postgres uses, I think, rolls their own for historic reasons, but most modern systems are not going to write their own hash function. And so this is just sort of a menu of the things you could possibly pick. The way to sort of think about this is that murmur hash was sort of the, the, one of the, the, the first of these new generation hash functions that care about speed um, that sort of came out in 2008. And then both Google and Facebook and other big tech companies kind of made their own versions of these things that have different properties. Um, the, in general, the, the state-of-the-art one that you almost always want to use is going to be the XX hash from, from Facebook. And it's, it's by this guy who created this Z standard uh, compression algorithm. Uh, there's, I think, up to version 3. And there's different flavors of, of XX hash. But this, this is going to be the one you're going to want to use, in, just in general. So if, you want to, if, you, if you're curious to know what kind of other hash functions are out there, uh, there's this GitHub repo, I think written by the murmur hash guy, called SMHasher. And it's basically a micro benchmark that can, looks at all possible different hash functions that are out there on the internet and runs them through his torture test and measures how, how good they are, uh, the, the collision rate and how fast they, they go. And then so in the readme here, he sort of has the ranking list of the, uh, of the latest one. So this is as of today. So rapid hash is apparently the fastest one. And then XS hash low, uh, three low, that's, that's the XS hash one there. That's the second fastest. And again, it's this trade-off between the collision rate and the... Uh, and the, um, and the speed, XX hash is usually the right one in most, in most situations. So that's it. That's all you need to know about hash functions. Use something that already exists. We're done, right? For data people, though, we, we care about, though, actually the, the data structure inside. So static hashing scheme that we're going to talk about, uh, we've got two variants called linear probe hashing and cuckoo hashing. And these we also categorized as what are called open addressing hash tables. Right? And that just means that the location of a, of a key that we're putting into our hash table 
is open, meaning it doesn't always have to be at the exact same location every single time. And so we're going to talk about linear probe hashing, which is probably the most common one, and the cuckoo hashing will be an extension of this. There's a bunch of different variants over, over the decades that people have tried to build to make better ha uh, static hash tables uh, that we're not going to cover in, in this class, but we'll cover in the advanced class, like Robinhood hashing, Hopscotch hashing, Swiss tables. I think that's Google has something on this as well. Um, right? They're all going to be variants of this, and it's really going to come down to being when it comes time, there's a collision, what do I do? Right? Do I move out whatever is in the space I want, or do I, do I look somewhere else to go? At a high level, that, that's the variations that they all, they're all trying to have. Right? But linear probe hashing is going to be the most simplistic one. And so the, the tricky thing about linear probe hashing, or at least when you try to Google and understand what's going on, there's the linear probe hashing that I'm talking about, and there's linear probing reverse to how you're going to probe into it, meaning you're just going to scan linearly. There's also quadratic probe hashing. There's other variants of that. And then at the end of the class, we'll talk about linear hashing, which is different from the linear probe hashing table, uh, which is because it's a dynamic scheme. But there, to make sure you understand, there are two distinct uh, approaches to handling hash tables. All right, so linear probe hashing, it's, it's, it's the most simplistic thing you can have. It's a giant array of slots that are fixed length where we can store data, key value pairs. And so we'll take our hash function for our given key, hash it, hash the key, and then mod n by the number of slots we have in our hash table. That's going to give us some starting point to jump into this giant array. And then we start looking for a free slot to put something in or the key that, that we're looking for. So again, the, the hashing seems going to vary in how you handle conflicts. So if I hash my key, I land into my, to the slot array, and the, the space is occupied because I'm trying to insert something then I'm just going to scan down in sequential order until I find the next free slot. Then I insert my key there. The inverse of that, if I'm trying to do a lookup of something, I hash it, mod n, land in the slot array, scan down linearly and look at every single key value pair until I find what I want, or I find an empty slot, in which case I know that the key I'm looking for isn't there. That's it. We'll, we'll go through an example. Uh, this is what you get, I would say, in, in, I think Python gives you this when you get a, when you get a, as for a dictionary, I'm pretty sure you, you get this data structure, but this, this thing is widely used in, in a lot of systems. Especially when, you, when you're doing hash joins, which we'll cover later, there, most people are going build, to build something like this, because it's so simple and it's actually really fast. So the one thing we need to keep track of in our hash table is this, this, this load factor, which is basically the percentage of the, the hash table that is occupied, uh, the, the, the slots that are occupied. And every system will have different uh, thresholds, but it basically says the load factor is if I go above some threshold, then I'm going to consider it being full, right? say like 70% load factor. Then I'm going to stop whatever I'm doing on this hash table if I need to still insert things into it, make a new hash table that's, that's double the size of my current one, and then scan through the old hash table, rehash all the keys, and put them into the new one. That's how you do resizing in these, these data structures. And obviously that sucks because like now you're blocking all your threads while you're just doubling the size of it. And this is what the dynamic hashing schemes will try to avoid. But oftentimes if you, if you can try to estimate the, the number of keys you need to put into it, then, uh, then you can try to avoid this. Right? Postgres tries to do this. Every day sometimes is when you're doing a hash, hash join, you have to build a hash table. It tries to estimate the number of tuples that's going to come up from the, 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 from the bottom of the query plan, from whatever table or, that you're scanning. And based on that estimate, then it sizes your hash table. If it gets it wrong, it has to stop, double the size, and, and load it all back in. But again, by sizing it uh, correctly, hopefully, you avoid that. And this goes back to what I was saying before. Like In the most extreme case, we just have this infinite size hash table. We would never have to do this block and resize. But because we, we live in reality, we, we have to size it to something. And we want to try to be not too conservative, because we don't want to resize, but not too big, because we don't want to waste memory that we, we could be using for other things. All right, so let's look at an example here. So again, so say these are all the keys I'm going to want to deal with, and this is, this is our hash table here. It's just you know, it's, uh, you know, an array of slots where we store key value pairs. So if I want to insert A, again, I hash it. I mod N, where N is the number of, of slots that I have in my hash table. I jump to some offset. In this case here, I see that it's empty, because it's say the very beginning of the hash table is empty. And I'm going to st store my, my key value pair. And we'll cover the next slide what the key value pair is. But let's say we're going to store the original key in there because we need to know when we start scanning, is this the same key that I'm looking for, right? So you still need the key. 
and then the value will be whatever payload or whatever we're actually trying to store. All right, so now I want to start B, same thing, hash it mod n, and then I jump to this, this top, top slot here. It's empty. I can go ahead and insert my, my I can go ahead and insert uh, key B. Now, I, if I do, I want to insert C. When I hash it, I land to that slot where A is, is currently occupying. So I, I can't store anything in there because A is already in there. So now I'm just going to have a cursor scan through the, the hash table until I find the next free slot. Then I can go ahead and insert C. And you can think of this as a circular buffer, meaning if I get to the bottom slot here, and again, I can't, can't find a free slot, I just loop back around and start over. Now, obviously, that means I need to keep track of where I started to avoid be, getting stuck in an infinite loop. But as I said, you would set the load factor to be like 70, 80% to avoid ever having to have an infinite loop. So now when I insert D, D goes where C is, can't, can't go there, scan down, the next three slides right below. Insert E, E wants to go where A is, can't go there, go down, can't go where C is, go down, can't go where D is, go down, and then I find my, my free slot there and I insert it. And let's just, let's just put F at the bottom here, same as before. Pretty easy, right? Any questions? Yes? Does this, like, does, does this complicate retrieval? So his question is, does, does this complicate retrieval? Because if I want to get C, say C's already in here, I hash it, I land where A is, I do my key, now that's why I have to store the key there. Now I compare C with A, A doesn't go C, so I keep scanning, aha, now the next slot I find C, right? But say I'm looking for you know, Q, I hash where A is, I compare Q to A, not there, I compare to C to A, not there, keep going, now I find my empty slot, therefore I know that Q cannot be in this hash table, because if it existed, I would have seen it you know, in, in the previous slots. Yes? This question is how do you handle deletions? We'll come to that in a second. Again, for some, depending on where you're using this in the data system, like a hash join, you're not going to deletes. You just insert, 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 read, 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 then throw it away. But yes, you, we need to handle deletes. We'll get that in a second. Yes? Your worst case, yes. How's this a good idea? Because yeah. again, if I size my hash table reasonably and I have a you know okay load factor, then I'm not going to have to do the end scan. I'll maybe be so many jumps away. Its simplicity is actually part of its advantage. And again, I'm just showing sort of this, this diagram on PowerPoint, but these would be potentially backed by disk pages. But now, I, if I'm just doing a sequential scan. If I have to go to disk, I'm doing special scan on, on contiguous pages for the hash table. Right? In practice, you know, you actually I don't know the number of how many hops you have to do to find what you're looking for. But again, there's other variations we're doing, we won't get into where like Robinhood hashing um, will actually can swap the order of things. If you say uh, if one key is farther away than what it should have been, then then my key, I can swap the order. So it's always kind of closer to where it should be. Right? Seems like a clever idea. It actually is often slower because simplicity make, makes a huge difference there. OK. So what are these key value pairs? What are the, what are the action entries? Well, there's two cases. Right? The easiest case is when the, the key is fixed length and the value is fixed length, like a 32-bit integer with a 32-bit integer. Then I can easily store that in my, uh, in my hash table because it's always going to be fixed length offsets. Meaning when I hash it mod n by the number of slots, I'm going to land exactly where I need to be. Right? And optionally, if I want to try to speed things up, I could store the hash that I computed when I inserted the key inside of the, 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 the key value pair as well. Right? Because as I'm scanning through, say it's like 32-bit uh, integer hashes, but then like 128-byte strings, it's way faster to do that string uh, integer comparison than look at the strings. So if I have the hash, that'll you know that'll I can easily check whether something are, are equivalent to each other. If they are, I still have to check the, the whole keys. But if they're not, I know that the whole keys will never match, so I just skip it. Right? Compute versus storage. I'm spending spend a little storage space to store the hash in the hash table, but uh, uh, you know my, my lookups could potentially go faster. 
to handle very lengthy keys, you basically have to have a whole separate table, a temp table, that's storing the, the thing you're actually trying to uh, represent. All right? So a temp table would be private to the query or whatever actually is running this. So we don't have to have all this extra mechanisms uh, for like recovery uh, we would have for, for regular data tables. Uh, in some cases, you know, we, we can have an optimized version of this. And it could just be also we piggyback off of the, the existing page infrastructure we have. So I'm not showing this as a slotted page, but it could just be a slotted page, right? It could just also point back to the, the, the original tuple itself. Not, not necessarily. You, you can't do that if you're doing joins. But the key will just be the hash that we have. And then the value is going to be the record ID. So both will be fixed length. So that'll handle our, our offset jumps into the array. And then the record ID is just a pointer, as we said before, a reference to where to find the, the, the whole data. So again, having the hash as part of the key, I can do a quick comparison to see whether the key I'm looking for hashes to the, the hash that I see. And if not, then I don't need to follow the pointer. If it does, then I need to go look down. So it's not, it seems like it'd be terrible because you're following this pointer for every single entry, but it's not that bad in practice because the hashes will, will not match. All right, so let's handle his question, how do you do deletes? Let's say I delete C. So again, doing delete is the same thing as doing a lookup. I first hash the key that I'm trying to delete, that do my offset jump into the slot array. I land where A is, A doesn't equal C, that's not what I want, keep scanning down, then I find C, now I have a match. Right? And I blow away the tuple. I blow away the entry in the hash table. So he's shaking his head no. Yes, why? Because if there are two regions and you happen to scan to like from A and downwards and you want a MC slot and you have to So he said, and he's correct, that if now I have this, this empty space in here. Well, I said that I was scanned through when I'm trying to do lookups to see, you know, to try to find my key. As soon as I find an empty slot, then I know that the thing I'm looking for isn't there. So now, if I have this empty slot in here and I scan, uh, I scan for D, I look to it, try to do lookup in D. D is going to hash to this location. It's empty. It says, oh, my search is done. You don't have what I want. But in reality, it's, it's right below where I wanted it. All right? So there's two approaches to handle this. One is just to do movement. So you take all the keys that are below you in the slot array from the entry you just deleted, and you rehash them and slide them up. All right? You're shaking your head no. Good idea, bad idea. Why? Why is it a bad idea? He says you have to rehash everything. Yes, it's expensive. It's not good. And this does solve our problem now. When we do a look at a D, it's gonna it's gonna find what we want. But as he said, this is super expensive. All right, and we have to rehash everything, and, and we don't want to do this. And in some cases, too, we have things like B over here. Like, say whatever reason it, it, it hashed to a new location, we have to slide it down, right? So yeah, the, 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 the blast radius of doing this optimization or doing this, this, this adjustment could be very expensive. And therefore, I'm not aware of any system that actually does this. A better approach is to use tombstones. So all we need to do now when we delete D Right? or sorry, delete C, we'll put a little marker here that says that this thing has been deleted, logically. And so now, when anybody comes along and does a scan, like I do look up on D, it lands to this location, sees the tombstone, and says, yeah, it's empty, but treat it as if it was, something was actually there. It's not my key. Uh, at least, at least it, it could have been your key, but it, it's not the key you're looking for right now. So then I just scan down through like, like I was doing before. Right? So this handles now the case where if I want to put something in there, again, if I see the, the tombstone, it's OK for me to treat this as empty, and I can put something there. And that doesn't foul up any of the ordering guarantees that we'd have under linear probing. So this is the most common approach. Now, again, some systems, when they have linear probe hash tables, they don't actually implement deletes because you don't need them in some cases. But if you do need to handle deletes, uh, logical tombstones would be the right way to do this. Yes? This question is, it, it, how do you treat tombstones as part of the load factor? Uh, you would treat that, actually, good question. I don't, don't know. Uh, it, it, again, if you, you would have to, you, would, you probably have to treat it as part of an occupied space because you have to jump through it. Um, 
And oftentimes you don't actually want to store the, the, the tombstone as part of the, 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 the entry here. Because how would you do that? You have to store an extra bit to say this thing's been logically deleted. And then now that fouls up with the line that, that we talked about before. So a more common approach is either within the page where the, where the, the slot's being stored for the, in the hash table, or even a global uh, uh, data structure where you just keep track of like, here's all the metadata about my, my hash table. And I check that first before I maybe go making decisions about what I'm looking at inside the hash table. So I can have a separate bitmap that says, for this slot location, is it empty or not? Yes? When I, when I say garbage collection, I mean what, sorry? Uh, yeah, so yes, yeah, so I say here, you may need periodic garbage collection. Yes, if you, if you want to keep reusing the, if you're not going to throw away the hash table and, it's, and it's, it's meant to be stick around for a long time, somebody needs to go through, look at all the tombstones, and then free up the space, and then potentially move things around. Yes. Okay. So the other thing we've got to handle is non unique keys, right? You'd have two, two, two records have the exact same keys but are pointing to different values, which is common in secondary indexes. So the easy way to do this, or one way to do this, is to do separate linked lists, right? So you have, the, you have your regular hash table doing linear probing, but the value now is going to be a pointer or some reference to some other uh, value list. And then now when I do a lookup for a given key, I follow that, follow that pointer, get the value list, and then do either a sequential scan if it's unsorted, or if they're pre-sorted, I can do binary search on that, right? But I have to follow something and do, look at somewhere else to see whether the, the, the value that I want is available. Or if I want all the values, I just you know, iterate over that list. But this, again, this requires now additional infrastructure in our system to maintain these, these, these uh, extra pages. So that's not, this isn't that common. The alternative approach is to have just cheat, treat redundant keys as, uh, just ignore them to treat them as unique keys, even though they're not really. And depending on what operation I'm doing, I have to be, make sure I, I uh, get all the entries for a given key and not just maybe the first one. So the idea is, like again, you just ignore that they're unique. Uh, and when I do an insert into them, I just do the scan as, as I did before and find the next free slot and insert it into it. And then now if someone says, give me all the, give me all the values for key X, Y, Z, I gotta scan through until I find uh, all the XYZs or until I get to the first empty slot, and then therefore I know I won't have any XYZ keys in there. So the second approach uh, is, is kind of more wasteful because you're storing the key multiple times, right? XYZ over and over again. I have a billion entries for it, I have to have a billion copies of XYZ in my hash table, versus this, this, the one up here, I only store it once. But then the downside is again, I have to maintain this, these extra value lists. Yes? So when we store the same key for a second time, do we just treat it as if there's a collision? This question is, when we store the, the same key the second time, do we treat it as a collision? Yes. Because I mean, we need to both. Right, I, I insert a new X, Y, say, I insert a new X, Y, Z, I hash into here, I, it's not a free slot, I skip, 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 keep scanning, then maybe the free slot's right here, then I insert X, Y, Z. And wouldn't the search be quite expensive? Like, so the question is, wouldn't the search be quite expensive? Yes, but like, again, depending on the size of my hash table, I might be okay. All right, so I'm going to quickly clue, uh, go through some optimizations you can do. This is more on the implementation side. So instead of having a general purpose hash table uh, where it can handle any possible key type and, and, and whatnot, you could actually have specialized through either C++ templating or uh, hand-rolled uh, optimized versions to handle keys of different sizes, right? And maybe because you maybe pack things in pages differently, maybe maybe you compress them in way, one ways versus another, right? If you know the types ahead of time and you try to do the most common things, like here's a bunch of integer keys or integer values, you can have optimized versions of these. Clickhouse does this. Clickhouse has 20 different versions of hash tables in their system for all the different possible types. So it's very impressive. Next one, you can store a separate metadata, or store the metadata as a, as a separate array or a separate hash table. As I said before, like you you could have this sort of this additional data structure that keeps all tr track of all the metadata about what's in your hash table, you check that first before you maybe check something in, in the, the full hash table. And that way, if something's not in the first, the, first, uh, the first data structure, you know it won't be in the larger one. 
And the last one is to, uh, if, if, you, if you don't want to blow away the, the hash table every single time and reallocate all the memory, if you want to be able to reuse it from one query to the next, you want a quick and efficient way to basically zero, zero out the contents of that hash table without having to go through it and overwrite everything. So when ClickHouse does this as well, so they basically maintain a version number for the hash table and then the pages for or slots are located, or even individual slots. So if I know that I'm done with this hash table, I'm using it for the next query, I just increment the, the, the version number by one. Now when I do any lookup in my hash table, if the slot does, version number doesn't match my table version number, I know it's from the older version, and I can treat it as empty. So there's a really great blog article uh, from the ClickHouse guys written by that, guy, that person over there that discuss all the very optimizations they do in ClickHouse, and it's very impressive. And this, of all the systems that I've seen that like, publicly talk about what they're doing in hash tables, ClickHouse does the most. Like, like I think Postgres has two hash tables. All right, they have 20. All right, so a variation of this is going to be cuckoo hashing. And the idea here is that it's going to be an alternative to having to do sequential scans to find the next free slot or find the key that I'm looking for. What we're going to do instead is have multiple hash functions. When we do our lookup in our hash table, hash the key multiple times to the different hash functions. They're all going to jump to different locations. And I use that to find a free slot or find the key that I'm, I'm looking for. Now the challenge is going to be, well, what if I want to insert something? I hash it multiple times, and all, all the slots are, are, are occupied. Well, now you're just going to steal one of the slots from somebody else, make them come out, and go back into the data structure. So now all your lookups and deletions are guaranteed to be 01, because you'll have to hash multiple times, but it's going to be one lookup to find the thing you're looking for. It's either going to be there or not there. You never have to scan. But the penalty is going to be when you do inserts, now you may be bouncing back and forth, kicking things in and out until you find enough free, free slots. So the only system that I know that does this is an accelerator for, for DB2 out of IBM called DB2 Blue. Uh, it's in the paper that they talk about, but it's, it's probably used in other systems I'm just not aware of. And then it turns out the best open source implementation of a Google hash table came from Dave Anderson at CMU. Uh, it was written by an undergrad several years ago, almost a decade ago. Uh, he still maintains it. The last commit was like three weeks ago, uh, even though he graduated. Um, and I think Dave said Google uses uh, the, their implementation a lot in, in other internal things. All right, so let's see how, what it looks like. Again, so say now I, I want to put, a into, uh, put key A into my, my hash table. Say I just have two hash functions. I think the default is in cuckoo hash. The cuckoo hash implementation is three. You can have any, any arbitrary number. And get, of course, there's a trade-off between how many hashings you're do, hashes you're, you're computing. But in this case here, I hash A once uh, for, or twice using the different hash functions. They're both going to map to different locations in, in my slot array. And then I flip a coin and pick whatever one I want to use. The, the table's empty. I'll use the first one. Now I put uh, insert B. Same thing, hash it twice. I get two locations here. The first hash function maps me to where A is, so that space is being occupied. So I can't use that. So I just use the second one, because that's empty. Yes? Uh, so in the, in the first case, you flip a coin. Uh, it flip a coin or pick the first, it doesn't matter. Yeah, his question is, would you actually compute the ha both hash functions simultaneously, or would you just compute the first one, check it's empty? You could just do it in, in serial order like that, yes. It doesn't matter. For visualization purposes, I'm just to show that we're looking at both. All right, B goes, again, B wants to go in. Can't go to the first hash function, because that's occupied by A. So we go to the first phase. So now we insert C. And the first hash function takes us to where A is. The second hash function takes us to where C is. So both spaces are occupied. So in this case here, Again, I, I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter whether you pick one versus the other, but let's say it's going to pick the, where B is, the second hash function. So it's going to clobber B over the head, take its slot, and kick it out of its house. Right? And now C is inserted, but now we've got to put, we gotta put, uh, we gotta put B back in. So B comes out. Since we know that it was hashed in with the second hash function, right? either we just hash them both of them and, and, see, and keep track of this, you wouldn't actually want to maintain extra metadata. But so, we know, so we're going to hash it again uh, for both of them. We see that the second one takes us where we just came from. So we've got to hash it from the first one. That takes us now to where A was. Remember, we saw that before when we inserted it. But now, again, since we know that we got taken out, uh, we've got to find a new, a new home, it's going to go steal A slot, 
go insert, insert this out there, A pops out, we hash it again, and now it finds a, a free slot. So now when we do a get, right, again, you can do this sequentially or you can do it parallel, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're going to ha you know, hash B twice, look at both locations until we find the, the key that, that we actually want. Yes? Um, why do we not store which hash function we use for each key so that we don't have to hash everything uh, like multiple times for each hash function and go look at what the... Our, our question is why did I say we don't want to store what hash function we use to get us our location in there? Because again, compute versus storage. I have a billion entries. I got to store now, you know, some, some bytes to say, uh, you know, what hash function I use. This is not worth it. Yes. If there are three keys that hashes to the same location, Yeah. So he points out he's correct. If now, say, going back here, if I do hash a back in, and there's some other key here, and now I know I try to put. Uh, you know, A got kicked out before, so both hash functions are, in, are pointing to things that are, that are occupied, you'd be stuck in an infinite loop. And you have to break out of that, keep track of that, and then double the size of the hash table and, and serve everything back in. Yes? Again, no free lunch here, but it's in practice, the, you know, we're, we're making the trade-off, we're making uh, inserts more expensive, but our lookups are going faster. This question is, do you keep a counter? You just keep, keep track, you can keep track of where did I start? What slot did I start in? And if I see it again, then I know I'm in infinite loop. Okay. So, uh, we have 30 minutes left, or actually 20 minutes left. All right, so let's go through this, the, the, the dynamic hash tables. I think maybe we'll have to roll over to linear hashing ne next class, but we at least cover chain hashing and extendable hashing. All right, so the, all the hash tables uh, that we just talked about so far, you have to know the number of keys ahead of time. Um, but again, you may not always know that, and you want to be able to, to, to grow. And so the, these dynamic hash tables, the idea is that they're going to incrementally resize themselves without having to rehash everything and load it into a second hash table. So the most common one that you're probably most familiar with is chain hashing. I think this is what you get when you get a hash map in Java and the JDK. And then extendable hashing, linear hashing are more advanced uh, alternatives. So chain hashing is you basically have now the, a slot array uh, that you're going to you hash into, and that's going to point to the beginning of this linked list, so this chain of buckets where we can insert uh, insert key value pairs. And so now when I want to do a lookup, I hash it myself into the slot array. That gives me a pointer to the beginning of this linked list, and now I, do, I sequentially scan it until I find the key that I'm looking for. Right? And if I need to insert something and there's no more space in that chain, I just add a new bucket and, and append it to the end of it. Right? So this thing can grow infinitely, and we'll see how to, how to handle that uh, in extendable hashing and linear hashing. But again, the idea is pretty, pretty straightforward. So again, I have my bucket pointers, my slot array. Uh, I do want to put an A, hash inside this. This gives me that pointer at the beginning of my linked list. I go ahead and insert A. Now I want to put on B, same thing, hash, hash into my bucket pointers. I jump to a, a beginning of the linked list, I start in A. Same thing with C, goes there. I put D. Now in this case here, you obviously would, would have more than two slots in a bucket, but for visualization purposes, assume that's the case. So in this case here, this bucket is full. So I'm going to have basically, I'm going to create a new bucket and keep track of this first one, that the, the pointer to, 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 to the next one in the chain. So if I, as I scan through looking for the key I'm looking for, if it's not in this one, but I've pointed to another bucket, then I've got to follow along that and get that. Right? Same thing for E and so forth. So in this case here, this is going to equally penalize um, uh, inserts and lookups because we have to follow these pointers. Whereas like in cuckoo hashing, we were making inserts, fa sorry, inserts slower, but lookups faster. Right? Everyone, everyone has to sort of pay the same cost in, with these cases. A simple optimization we could do, and we'll see this later on when we talk about hash joins, is that in this bucket pointer thing, I, could still, I still want to maintain a pointer to the beginning of the hash table, but I can put a filter data structure in front of this that tells me whether the key exists in my bucket chain. Right? Because now basically I'm partitioning the key space within these, these bucket chains. So for this filter here, I could have a, a, sort of a data structure that says, does this key even exist? Yes or no? Can't tell me where it is, right? but it just tells me, does it exist in my set? 
So now when I do a lookup, I check the filter first. If the filter says no, it doesn't exist, then I don't even bother following the pointer and look at anything else. Right? When you, when you use this, you, or this filter will be essentially be a bloom filter. We'll cover that next week, what that's going to be. But think of like a probabilistic data structure that, that can tell me does something exist or not really fast. Again, we'll cover that later. So in the case of the, the chain hash table, as I said, it can, the chain can grow infinitely. Right? It has no mechanism, no way to say this chain is, this grows forever and That'd be terrible, obviously, because if I have really high skew where everything's hashing to one, uh, to one chain, then it's just sequential scan or linear scan to find anything, right? That's the worst case end that we talked about before. So extendable hashing is going to be a technique that's going to allow us to incrementally split our buckets when chains go too, too, too long and then rebalance things without having to rehash everything that we, that we saw before. And linear hashing will be another technique as well. So this technique is not that common. It dates back from the, I think the 80s. Um, but the only two systems that I know that implement this is the GNU DBM. Think of this as like a embedded key value store you could have in your application, similar to like RocksDB, uh, right? It's just a key value interface. And then asterisk DB is a, was a sort of a big data uh, system for like HDFS or Hadoop world um, that came out of uh, UC Irvine that I think uh, Couchbase now uses. Um, but from their, their documentation, they're, they're using extendable hashing. All right, so it's going to be just like before, where we have this, the, the, the bucket list, uh, or sorry, the, the, these pointers here, they're going to point to buckets. But now we're going to maintain some extra meta, uh, metadata to keep track of how do we examine the data that a, a, that a, that a slot's going to point to. So there's going to be this global, uh, sort of the, this global bit counter that's going to say, what's the maximum number of bits we would have to examine to figure out in our hashes where, where we need to go. And then for just simplicity reasons, we're also going to maintain these local counters that says, for this given chain uh, of buckets, here's how many bits you had to look at to, to get to them. Right? So you see, we've already inserted some data. The first one is going to be only one bit. The bottom two are going to be two bits. And so what does that mean? So that means that, again, when I hash my key, I'm going to get back an integer. It's just much, you know, 32 bits. And I'm going to look at uh, those bits that tell me what slot position do I want to look at in, in my uh, pointer array. So in this case here, the first two uh, entries, I'm only going to look at the first bit. So both of these guys are going to point to that one at the top because uh, that has the local bit of one. Right? These, these ones down here, I'm going to use the full maximum number of bits set by the global counter, and that I'll look at both of them, and they're going to hash to two different locations. So now, what is this, what's going on here? The slot array could have multiple entries point to the same, the same bucket. And that's okay. So here's how to do a lookup. When I do a lookup on A, I hash it, mod it, uh, sorry, I hash it, get, get some bit, bit array, and then look at my global counter, and it tells me how many bits I need to look at. And then now when, when, I, when I examine those two bits, that's going to tell me what position I'm at in my slot array and that gives me the pointer to where the, the bucket chain is for, for, for this key. All right? So now I'm doing a put. Again, look at my uh, global counter. It's set to two. So when I do a put, I look at the first two bits. That tells me that I, I want to go to one zero. I follow that pointer. It takes me to this bucket chain. And I go ahead and insert my entry in there. Do it another time. Let's put C in. Again, look at the first two bits. Tells me what location in, I want to look at. I follow that pointer, and that takes me to this bucket. And now the, the bucket's full. So I need to overflow it. I need to allocate more space for it. Uh, but the way we're going to do this, we're, it's going to be localized to just this portion of the, of, of, the, of the hash table. And I don't need to rebalance any of the other uh, bucket chains. So I'm going to increase my global counter to three, expand out this slot array. Or this pointer array, that's cheap, right? That's a bunch of just, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's just a bunch of 32 bit pointers or 64 bit pointers. It, that thing's not really big. So, so resizing that and copying things over is not a big deal. And then now I want to add my new, new, um, my new, yeah, my, my new bucket chain. And then I'm going to look and look at all the bits as they go along. And that's going to point to the different locations. So going back here, again, these guys here, 
that, that one at the top, that's still only using one bit, right? So if the first bit is zero in my position in the slot array, they're going to point to that first, that first chain, right? Then the second one, uh, for this one, we're still looking at two bits. So that goes down here. But then anyone that has three bits, all right, they're going to point to, to different locations. Then I can go ahead and, and insert, the, uh, insert C. So again, I moved things around, or sorry, I readjusted the, uh, the hash table without having to rehash everything. And because this, going back here, because this thing overflowed, right, instead of having, just adding another a, a bucket behind it in the chain as we did in chain hashing, I said I'm going to overflow it, make it, split, it, split its keys into two different buckets, but I, and I just update the slot array without updating all the other, uh, without updating all the other buckets. Yes? Is there a reason 000 doesn't point to anything? Uh, question, is there a reason why? Yeah, that's a mistake. Yes. Uh, 000 should point to, go back here. Yeah, it should, should, point to, should point to the top one. Right, yeah, so in the first bit, the first bit is zero. They should all should be pointing to the top one here. Thank you for fine. I'll fix that. Right? And then the next one is, is, uh, when it's, what is it, uh, 1, 1, all point to the bottom one. And then we have 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 1. Right? Th those two are distinguished. They point to separate, separate chains. Thank you. His question is, what would happen if the first bucket overflowed? So you would just you'd split it. And then now, since the, the local counter is 1, its, it's counter would go to 2. So now you have two buckets, and you would have uh, 0, 0, 1, sorry, 0, 1 would go to one bucket, and 0, 0 would go to another, another bucket. Do we need to rehash everything in the first bucket when we split? Yeah, so when you split a bucket, you rehash everything that, that's inside that bucket. But because it's, it's not an arbitrary length of, uh, bucket chain, it's not a, it's, it's not a major, uh, major operation. So you're sort of amortizing the rebalancing across the multiple queries. I'm rushing this, but we can, we can cover this again on, uh, on Monday. There's more questions. All right, the other alternative approach is do linear hashing. And this is actually what, what Postgres does. Um, they call it the DynaHash in, in the source code. Um, and actually, the, the reason why Postgres has this data structure, because um, the woman who was a PhD student at Berkeley, she wrote it, the, this hash table, and put it into to Postgres. And then she had a startup called uh, Sleepy Cat Software that made Berkeley DB that used the same sort of hash table idea, right? And then Oracle bought them, and, uh, and, and you know, now Oracle owns it. But all right, so this is a bit more complicated. But what's going to happen is that we're going to maintain this extra, this extra, we call it a split pointer, that's going to tell us what's the next bucket that we want to split. And this will be different than extendable hashing. Extendable hashing was. Any time a bucket over, overflow became full, I split that bucket and only that bucket. Extendable hashing, sorry, linear hashing is going to be different where I'm going to split whatever I'm pointing at with my split pointer, which may not necessarily be the, the, the bucket that overflowed, but the idea is that eventually I'll get to that bucket that overflowed and rebalance things. Right? It's almost like doing this, a random splitting, but over, over longer periods of time, Everything balances out, and everything will get, uh, you know, will get get split. So we're going to maintain multiple hash hashes to figure out what's the right bucket we need to look at for a given key. Again, based on where, where our split pointer is pointing at, and then there's other things we can deal with, like when should we actually overflow? Is it just when, when we run out of space on our page? Uh, if 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 it's uh, if for one page, if we have ten pages, that, you know, that are interchained, then we overflow. Right? You can, different systems can do, you can do different things. The idea is again, we want to localize the resizing of our hash table to just some portion of it, which may not be the one that overflowed, but that's okay. So again, we have our bucket pointers that are pointing to different lo locations, right? And these are just numbered in, in sequential order. And then we have this split pointer that's again to point to what's the next bucket chain that we're going to over or that we're going to split whenever we overflow. And so we'll have a hash function that says, uh, for a given key, 
you know, run through the hash function and then mod at n where it ends the number of, uh, of, of bucket pointers we have at the time that this, we instantiate this hash table. So we have four entries here. So we take the key and mod it by, mod it by four. All right, so now I'm going to do a, a get on six, right? I just take my first hash function that I have, mod it by four, and I get two, and then I find the key I'm looking for, right? So that just looks like the chain hashing that we saw before. Nothing fancy. If I'm going to put 17, I hash it, mod by four, gives me the offset of one. But now when I go to that chain, I see that the, the bucket is full, so I need to overflow. So I'll create a new bucket, just as I did in my chain hash table, extend it out, and then I insert 17. But now I need to have my split pointer instantiate the, uh, a splitting procedure to rebalance or to, to, to split whatever it's actually pointing at. So in this case here, it's pointing at zero. So I need to go and, and split zero. Even though, again, it didn't overflow, it still has free space. This is just how the algorithm works. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a new entry to my, my bucket pointer array. Sorry. And then I'm going to mod, uh, make a new hash function. We're going to mod by 2n because it's double the number that I had before. So I had four entries before, and eventually I'm going to have eight entries. So the reason why we, we can do 2n because we're going to hash this key first, see whether it's, it's below, above or below where our split pointer is lo located at. If it's below it, we just need this hash function. It's a, if, it's, yeah, if it's above it, we just need the, the first hash function. If it's below it, we need the one down below. And then we'll, the split pointer will keep going down until we reach whatever the, entry, whatever the, the length of n was when we instantiated the hash, the hash function, so in this case, 4. So once we get past 3, we then loop back around and start, start all over again. So let's see what it looks, looks like. Okay, so now we have a new entry 4. We're going to create a new, new, new chain here, a new bucket. Then we go through and all the entries that were in the, 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 the bucket that we split, we need to hash them now by the second hash function. So hash 8. Mod by 8, it's 0, so it stays where it's currently located. Hash 20, mod 8, we get 4. That's now going to land down here, and we go ahead and insert 20 down there. So do a delete up there, and then do an insert and 20 down below. And once this, this rebalancing is done, again, just for the one chain that we split, we move our split pointer down by 1. Now when I do a lookup on 20, right, 20 uh, mod 4 gives me 0. Zero is above my, uh, my split pointer. Yeah, sorry, it's above, if it's above the split pointer, you've got to look at the second one. If it's below, you know it hasn't been split yet, so you can just use the first hash function. So in this case here, I would mod uh, you know, hash by 20, mod by 4, I get zero. Zero is below where 1 is. Uh, so then now I've got to hash it again, and then now I get 4, and then I can find the key that I want. In the other case, I get to do the lookup on 9. Hash by 4, I get 1. 1 is where the split pointer is pointing at, so I know it hasn't been split yet. So therefore, I only need the first hash function, and I find the thing that I'm looking for, and I'm done. All right? So this, again, seems bizarre that you're splitting things that aren't the, what, what, you, know, what you want to be. You're not splitting the thing that overflowed. You're splitting whatever you're pointing at. But again, eventually, we will get to that. And everything will work out just fine. All right, so in the sake of time, let me go quickly just talk about deletes. Deletes basically says if I, if I recognize that I'm deleting an entry and now the, 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 the bucket is empty and I'm below my split pointer, then I can theory, I just, I just clean it up, throw it away, and then move the split pointer back up. Right? And it's a localized chain. All right, so just to finish up. So the, these are going to be, hash tables are going to be important data structures that absorb O1 lookups for us. And like I said, they're going to be used all throughout the data system in, in different ways. You can use them for table indexes, and we'll look at examples uh, next week. But in practice, this is not what you're going to use because they're not going to support range queries. Uh, you can't do things less than, greater than. You can only do a quality predicate. So there's something equals something in my hash table. And furthermore, I, can, I have to have all the keys in order to do my lookup. So my index is on AB. I can't do a lookup and a hash index without AB because otherwise I can't hash to the location. Right? Whereas in a B plus G, we'll see we can do partial key lookups. So when you call create index in a, in a database like this, 99% of the time, you're going to get a B plus G, right? Which you're really getting something in Postgres. You would declare what data structure you want to use. 
But in Postgres, you can actually say using hash, you can tell it I want to use a hash table, and it's going to use the, the, the linear hash table uh, that we were talking about at the end. OK? All right, I realized I was rushing this again, but we, 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 I'll recap everything on, on, uh, on Monday. So starting next week on Monday, well, again, we'll talk about order preserving trees, and we're really going to focus hard on the B plus tree because it is the best data structure of all time, right? Tries are not tries are pretty good too, but guess what? You can put your tries in, in your B plus tree, right? You can do everything with it. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Andy. Thank you all for having me. Uh, this will be quite the palette cleanser from HashMaps. I apologize in advance. Uh, so my name is Nico. Uh, I lead the backend team at Relational AI, where we deal with query optimization and materialized views and incremental view maintenance and all kind of fun stuff like that. And I'll try to give you a bit of a flavor of like what uh, Relational AI is, is all about. All right. Uh, our thesis uh, is that uh, the next generation of enterprise apps will be intelligent, and that can mean everything or nothing, I guess. Uh, for us, intelligent applications uh, apply models of the real world to data. Um, and they do that in order to improve decision making and take action automatically. And that is what distinguishes them from like uh, business intelligence and reporting and all these kind of like backward looking things. Uh, and it's really about like putting the data to work and actually take action in the in the real world. Uh, and so the need for this kind of like repeatable high quality decision making, I guess, is kind of unlimited. And so uh, we believe that every business will need like as many of them as they can get um, and developing and putting them into production quickly is, is critical. Uh, and so to give you some kind of sense of like what uh, decisions these intelligent, uh, intelligent applications will first help make and then later make themselves, we're thinking about stuff like which users are committing fraud here? Uh, should I open a new warehouse? If so, where should I do that? Uh, what is the optimal maintenance schedule, right? Like I have an optimization problem given my current real situation uh, on the ground. And all of that uh, intelligent applications um, are supposed to handle. Uh, but we see that software complexity, like so many other things, is uh, holding back uh, intelligent applications. And here we're really talking about complexity, not in the uh, asymptotic sense, the big O sense, but rather as the things that make a system hard to understand. Uh, and uh, we believe that at the end of the day, uh, this complexity really grows with three things. Uh, that is state, control, and uh, the overall volume of code uh, that you're dealing with. And that's because state, basically, the more state your system keeps, uh, the more scenarios you have to consider to understand uh, how your system is behaving. And the more control logic, the more explicit control logic you have, uh, the more kind of paths through that state space you have to consider in order to understand what's going on. And then the more, uh, uh, the more code you have to describe all this stuff, uh, it just compounds these problems, right? If you have your millions of lines of code, then, then all of this will be worse as if you had like 100,000 lines of code. Um, and so uh, the headlines here are kind of inspired by a relatively well-known paper called Out of the Tarpit. Uh, and uh, we at Relational AI, we really believe that uh, the things that get you into this tarpit of software complexity are architectures where the uh, inputs into the system and the implications of that in, of those inputs are both part of the system state and they're managed explicitly. And really like the simplest example of this, if you imagine you have like a chat application and you need to model all those messages and whether the message is read or not or whatever. Uh, and then a very common thing you see is like people basically keep a counter of like the unread messages, right? And now whenever a new message pops in or a user takes an action, you have to update both the state about the messages and the state of the counter, right? And that's like cause all kinds of fun things in web applications and it basically doesn't scale to any in any kind of real world uh, uh, application, this explicit managing uh, of implications. And in these architectures, business logic also tends to be hidden behind like layers and layers of boilerplate, and JavaScript APIs and all that stuff. And so uh, uh, we think of these as application centric architectures, which really just means that even though all these applications are working off more or less the same data, the data that is coming into a business, each of these applications kind of comes up with their own slightly divergent interpretation of the data. And so the things that get you out of this tarpet uh, are systems where um, only the actual inputs form your state and all the implications of those inputs are automatically derived by the system through reasoning. And reasoning for us is just the principled application of rules and other kinds of models uh, in order to derive new information from your inputs. 
And in such a system, the business logic should be as much as possible declarative and focused on what is true about your business rather than focusing on like how to compute those things. And so uh, we and other people call these uh, kind of architectures data centric, which again means a lot of things to a lot of people. But the key thing here is that the data and the interpretation of the semantics are kept close, cl close together. And so my colleagues at Relational AI, we, we see this in the wild at many companies and many of my colleagues have helped build these kinds of systems successfully at, at uh, places like Amazon and Intuit and, and whatever. Yeah. All right. Uh, but the problem with this is that uh, uh, if you have a data centric architecture, the problem is data doesn't really like to move anymore and it just keeps accreting workloads and it keeps accreting processes for governance and budgeting. And that's really a problem if you're trying to start a database company. And so we want to help our customers build intelligent applications right where their data is today. And for us, that's Snowflake. And so Relational AI is built on top of Snowflake and it runs in the Snowflake data cloud uh, called Container Services. Uh, and from, from that environment, we inherit security, governance, billing infrastructure, all these things that are really hard to replicate um, uh, as a startup. Okay, so uh, if we want to build a system to help our customers deal with all this complexity, we really kind of have to manage our own internal complexity, right? And this is where we believe that database theory has something unique to offer to us as system engineers. And there's many examples of where this kind of connection happens at Relational AI. And I'm just trying to give you like a, a flavor, an example um, that, that uh, I really like. And so the example that I picked here is the idea of query classes. Uh, basically we need a strategy so that we don't go insane when users throw like arbitrary real world business logic at us, right? We're no longer talking about like simple SQL queries. This is really kind of complex business logic. And database theory gives us the frameworks uh, with which we can like understand those queries based on by looking at the variables in the query and by looking at the relations that tie those variables together. And each of those query classes that we can identify is backed by like a body of theoretical uh, results. And that means if you know the class, you immediately know uh, many relevant things like, can this be parallelized? Uh, will this scale? Uh, can I incrementally maintain this without blowing up? This kind of stuff, right? And so we use query classes uh, to drive our evaluation strategy as a whole, right? So uh, for example, a couple of years back, we had to ask ourselves like, okay, how will we evaluate and maintain arbitrary queries over like many terabytes of data? Uh, and for us, query classes are the way, right? Like we look at the query, we understand the class it belongs to, and we try to break it up into subqueries from simpler classes until we hit one that is low enough that we know how to scale it, right? And so in our case, uh, we try to boil everything down to uh, uh, a class of queries known as prefix joins, uh, and um, we connect those prefix joins with a distributed sorting algorithm. And both of these primitives have the distinction that they are very scalable and they are latency tolerant. And for us as a database that is built natively on the cloud and works with data and blob storage, this property of being latency tolerant is extremely helpful. Uh, and so this is kind of what drives uh, our strategy there. And then another interesting way in which this kind of like theory framework for thinking about the queries that users throw at us uh, helps us with is to keep the optimization problem trackable, right? Because I mentioned that we're making this promise that people can throw, uh, they can focus on like uh, describing their business logic and we will pick the best algorithm for the job and, and optimize uh, 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 their logic. Uh, but that's of course a very hard problem and it's hard way beyond like all the typical things about join ordering and cardinalities and all that stuff, right? Like there's so many questions. Uh, do you focus on asymptotics or do you focus on uh, the time it takes you to optimize uh, the, the, the query? Do you focus on finding the best possible plan for a single query or do you focus on finding something that is reusable in many different situations? Do you focus on evaluating from scratch versus incremental maintenance? There's so many, uh, uh, so many different dimensions. Um, and so what we can do is that if we know a class, the class that the query falls in, uh, we can pick um, uh, deterministically a canonically good plan. This might not be the best possible plan for that query, but it is a known good plan under some uh, well thought out cost model. Uh, and we can offer that plan for the opt to the optimizer for consideration, right? And so that way we don't hurt the quality. The optimizer can always overrule the decision, but it reduces effort. Uh, it improves the robustness of the optimizer's decision. Uh, and it also helps explain why a query is performing the way that it's performing or why the optimizer made a um, specific choice. 
Um, and so uh, uh, this is really kind of like something to to break that problem down into something that is more manageable, where you where where you don't have a cost optimization problem with an infinite number of of dimensions. All right. And so uh, to summarize this, um, uh, the first takeaway here is that we think that software complexity is really holding back uh, these new intelligent applications. And we want to fight that with data centric architectures where the semantics, the interpretation of the data is very close to the data itself. We don't want users to spell out the implications of new data. They, uh, they should let the system do the reasoning. And they should uh, reduce code volume with declarative languages as much as possible, right? We want to let the system figure out the best algorithm to use for the job. The second takeaway here is that uh, data has gravity, that we found that out the hard way. And uh, it won't come to you. You have to go to where the data already is. Uh, and the final takeaway uh, is that systems in theory, in our experience, really like need each other, right? They keep each other grounded. Systems engineers can easily change like random unconnected benchmarks and theorists can easily like go off into space. And so um, in particular, ideas like these query classes and these frameworks help us make this like general purpose system that we're building tractable. Uh, because an architecture that is efficient under some cost model that might not be the most realistic one usually beats an architecture that is not efficient under any uh, cost model. And so these kind of principles, guarantees, and invariants that uh, database theory kind of um, uh, occupies itself with, they are really what keep a system going uh, at scale and with uh, lots of people working on it. All right. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so much. Uh, awesome. Get in touch if you like. And if you want to learn more about the system, my former colleague, Martin, he gave a long talk here at CMU about two years ago that you can find on YouTube. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We have one question. Are you still guys taking SQL and then co-genning it into Julia and then, and then compiling that? No, uh, we're not taking SQL. Uh, so we have our own uh, declarative language and uh, we uh, provide different frontends for that. So people can basically uh, uh, create these queries in Pyrel. Uh, that's our Python, our Python interface. And it boils down to our own internal language called RHEL. Uh, and so SQL for us is more like another interface language. It's not what we compile to. And do you, do you compile RHEL to Julia, or the system is written in Julia? Yes, yes. So we we no longer are an exclusively compiled uh, evaluator. We also uh, do interpretation, but uh, we are still written in Julia. Yes. Do you support data log anymore, or is that that, that was logic blocks? Uh, well, like our internal uh, uh, target language, um, uh, when basically all the higher order um, uh, features of the RHEL language are compiled away. That basically is data log with like aggregations and all that stuff and uh, recursion. Got it. Uh, awesome. But we don't expose it that much. Got it. Awesome. All right. Let's thank him again. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really you can't you can't see the people uh, applauding for you. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a simple more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you Let my girl run me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turn with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with same odds